history. I'll give you a story so you can root around inside. Now, 35 years ago, I was a student in seminary, but seminary students are young people, and so when Halloween came around, we threw a Halloween party, and we threw it in the building itself. We were a small community, and of course, Halloween parties, at least 35 years ago, included the costumes and the candy and bobbing for apples. Now, if you're under 40, this makes about as much sense as stropping a razor. So let me define bobbing for apples. It consists of a large tub of water, we used a kid's wading pool, inside, and you float apples in it. They naturally float, in case you don't know. And putting your hands behind your back, you bend over and try to pick one up with your teeth. Hilarious. Well, I'm telling you all this because as we're preparing this ancient pastime, into the seminary comes a grand old professor of comparative religions. His office was in there. A fellow by the name of Mircea Eliade, Romanian-born, profound scholar, someone, well, you may not know of him as much as you know of his rival, Joseph Campbell. They represented two different schools of approach. And I'm of the Eliadian school, so I like his words. I learned about Joseph Campbell later. But Eliade, who was an old man then, 80 years old some, he looked like an old European man with the frumpy coat and the pulled-down fedora and the, and the deeply accented English and the furrowed brow with the very wispy, with the wispy eyebrows. And he looked at this big tub of water with all the apples and said, what is this? And we said, it's bobbing for apples. And we could see his little mind going through the encyclopedia of religion, clicking through all of them, Indonesians, Indians, Africans, Asians, trying to find a place to put this bizarre ritual. I mention this because I want you to have that same experience he did. That whenever you encounter a, an unusual event, something symbolic or ritual-like that instead of being mystified or puzzled that it evokes in you a thousand echoes. Fire and light turn up everywhere in ancient religion. I've already mentioned that. Of course, one of the things we forget now because we can turn on electric lights at whim is that kindling fire was something that had to be done almost every day until the year 1500 or 1600 or later. My great-grandmother was born in Utah in 1898 and she had to light a fire to cook her breakfast. Today we turn a knob and then we decide, or we punch in a number of seconds and the microwaves do things. I want you to realize that fire and light have their power in the antiquity of human experience. When we literally, if we didn't have a fire, it was pitch dark at night. I mean, no light. And if you let it go out, wild things would come and harm you. You understand where I'm going? If you've ever been on a camp out, like to South Manitou, and your, and your campfire went out, you look around and you say, holy mackerel, it's dark here. Or if you had a power outage, suddenly you can feel that ancient anxiety about darkness and how powerful light can be. So when Diwali and Hanukkah are being observed today, we no longer feel the power of light because we don't understand the power of darkness the way we used to either. But I want you to find a way to reconnect with that. For example, in Diwali, the word means a row of lamps. Not just a lamp, a row of lamps. Why does it mean a row of lamps? Well, it turns out there are three different stories that explain it, and they don't relate to each other. One of them is about the, the hero Rama who comes back from his exile and you lay out a row of lamps to welcome him. Another is about Krishna who defeated the demon of darkness. We light lamps. And another is about Lakshmi who will visit the who comes and visits homes that day and those with the most lights and the cleanest homes will get good luck. Kind of an Indian Santa Claus motif. Three stories to explain one thing. Well, which is the right one? All of them. Why? Because for a cinch, 
everyone was lighting lamps already. And they looked for a reason to explain why they were lighting lamps. We in the West tend to think, well, we, come, we do rituals in order to, to express a value. We do this to say this. We mean this when we do that. I'm going to invert that. The reality is, friends, we do rituals and then make up reasons for doing them. We do. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. We act and then we explain our actions. The Christian community has been offering bread and wine since the first week after Jesus died. They did it because Jesus told them to. It took generations to create elaborate doctrines and rituals and ceremonies, but they did it and then explain it, not the other way around. This is what you need to know, is that we're ritual beings. We do things and then look for reasons why we do them. In Hanukkah, we have one story with several explanations. In Diwali, we have three stories with one explanation. Everywhere you go, actions beg for answers. And that's why I want you to listen for the consonants and the dissonance. The consonance is that we light lights, that we prepare food. The dissonance is we don't know why, what they mean. We go grasping, searching, hoping for meanings. As Schweitzer said, we want to find in our lives some sense of value. And so we look in all the nooks and crannies in the things we do every day. Does this mean something? Does this mean something? Why do we do this? What do I mean? The yearning for meaning and purpose is universal. It's as universal as everything we knew, do. That's what I want you to understand, is every time you look at an action, you're looking at a potential window into the spiritual experience. They're not limited to things in church. They're not just the rituals. They're not just the theologies. Anything you do can become a ritual window through which you can see the whole universe. And when you do, when you have that moment, and you can have those moments, you see not just the dissonance and not just the consonance, you see them both. And they blend together into, a, into something larger. We can live with dissonance. We can live with struggle. We can live with trouble if we think it's part of a larger, encompassing reality. What we want is to sense inside as well as intellectually that there is a wholeness to things and that we belong to it. We want it for our individual lives. We want it for the world itself. We want to believe that everything connects and holds together and somehow matters from the cosmic clouds of dark matter down to the subatomic clouds of bosons and quarks. We want to think that somehow it all matters, including me. And that's what we look for in all of our daily acts. Now, of course, most things don't reveal the universe to us. Most of the time, we don't see God coming on clouds of glory when we pop open a can of Diet Coke. At least, I hope not. Most of the time we don't encounter Lakshmi when we sweep out the closet and find dust bunnies. That's okay. What I want you to be aware of is that anything at any moment could function as a window for you, if not the universe and all religions. Did you, on, Saturday, on Thursday, I, I gave myself the pleasure of actually watching television for no good reason, but I ended up watching something on PBS, so I feel very noble. And it was a story, a documentary on Nova, I think, about a gentleman who raised, tried to raise 16 wild turkeys in the wild. Did anyone else see that? Weird. I, mean, I thought, you eat turkey and then you watch. Never mind. The gentleman was a scientist and he wanted to, Ill, to make himself hit the virtual mother of these turkeys. So that meant that they had to imprint by looking at him, and they all did. And for months, they followed him around like make way for ducklings going from place to place. And they grew, and he observed them, and he was there to observe them. But something he didn't expect was that by being in the company of wild creatures, they led him into the wild world he did not see. He lived out in the countryside, but when he was with the turkeys, suddenly there were more animals around than when he was by himself. 